Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special conversation in honor of Cancer Immunotherapy Month. I'm Jessica Foley, Chief Scientific Officer for the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. Before we get started, just a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again through the link you received when you registered. You will receive a link to a recording of the webinar as well. And if you'd like to ask a question, please submit it at any time via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll collect these questions and answer as many as possible during the audience Q&A portion of our discussion. And now to our discussion. Today, we're joined by Jill O'Donnell Tormey, who is the CEO and Director of Scientific Affairs for the Cancer Research Institute. CRI is a leader in the cancer immunotherapy field for more than 65 years and is dedicated exclusively to advancing immunotherapy to treat, control, and cure all cancers. Since 2015, CRI has also been an important partner to the Focused Ultrasound Foundation in our goal of advancing the development and ultimate clinical adoption of new focused ultrasound and cancer immunotherapy treatments. We joined forces because we recognize that the intersection of focused ultrasound therapy and cancer immunotherapy offers a highly promising opportunity for combination approaches to treat a variety of cancers. The Focused Ultrasound Foundation has a dedicated cancer immunotherapy program that's seeking to turn this promise into reality. And I'll talk a little bit later about Focused Ultrasound, what it is and its potential role to play here. But first, let's get started with the conversation. So good morning, Jill, welcome. Hi, Jessica, thanks for having me. Sure. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, can you explain what is cancer immunotherapy? So very simply, I think cancer immunotherapy is a cancer treatment that uses the power of your body's own immune system to recognize and destroy cancer, uh, potentially preventing it, controlling it, or maybe even curing it in some cases. So it's a, a broad term that uh, has a lot of complexity to it, but that's it in a nutshell. Uh, can you share a little bit about CRI and your mission and, and how it was that you became focused exclusively on this type of treatment for cancer? Sure. So the Cancer Research Institute, as you said, has been around since 1953. And we've always had this singular focus way before it has become really a revolution in the way cancer is treated over the last 10 years. And we have real, it's a really interesting story. We have deep roots. The founder of our organization, Helen coley Knotts father, Dr. William B. Coley, who is now considered the father of cancer immunotherapy, was a surgeon in the 1890s. And at that time, the only real treatment for cancer was, was surgery. And obviously, that didn't work all the time. He uh, became developing, he developed a treatment that uh, that he found and hypothesized would work because he looked at the records in his hospital at the time and saw that occasionally people went and underwent spontaneous remissions of their cancer if they developed an acute bacterial infection. So he created what came to be known as Coley's toxins, which was originally a mixture of two live bacteria. Subsequently, it was killed bacteria. And he injected these directly into tumors that were visible, most in the case of sarcoma. And he had a remarkable response rate. His first patient actually, uh, you know, his cancer completely disappeared. Of course, Coley had no clue how this worked. It was a, a bold thing to do at the time. This is pre-antibiotics. Uh, so uh, that was a, certainly a risk and something that wouldn't have been done now. And of course, there was also variability between the, the toxins that were just grown up in a laboratory and mixed. And because there was not, uh, you know, understanding of what it was, I think his work became overshadowed when radiation was discovered and that became the treatment du jour. Uh, after his death, his daughter uh, decided to write his biography and found all his patients' records and became convinced that the scientific and medical community had abandoned her father's work prematurely. So she started this organization uh, to really originally get interest back into Coley's toxins. And in the first, I'd say 10 to 15 years of CRI, is really focused on her really tracking down patients, finding out if they've been treated with cholitoxins, how they died, and really becoming an expert on, on bacterial uh, infections and such. And it wasn't only until the, about the 60s that a, uh, a, one of the 
investigators that CRI was funded was a Dr. Lloyd Old, who is now considered the father of modern cancer immunotherapy, came from Berkeley to Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he was very interested in inflammation and cancer and the immune system. And he had discovered something called tumor necrosis factor, which is a, 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 a cytokine that's released by cells of the immune system. And he found in experiments when you took TNF and injected it directly into tumors in mice, the tumors disappeared, became necrotic, very much the same way that Coley had seen in his patients. So here became the link potentially of how Coley's to toxins had worked and it had to do with the immune system. So it was really Lloyd Old in the 60s that really put CRI on the path telling Helen uh, science needed to catch up with her father. And in fact, let's focus on training the next generation of immunologists because we needed to understand a lot more about how the immune system worked before it could be applied intelligently to cancer. And so that's how we started. It's the vision of him and the scientists that he brought together. And there was always this small cadre of, I mean, the medical community never really for many, many years believed immunotherapy worked. I think they felt it had been tried and failed. And it really probably hadn't been tried properly because we didn't understand mechanistically enough about the immune system to use it in the right way. But I'm very pleased that we stayed the course, had a very long vision, starting very much with just basic discovery and only when we learned enough about the immune system that we really moved into more translational research and to clinical research. And uh, very proud that we have funded some of the seminal discoveries that are the foundation of where cancer immunotherapy is today. Great, that's a really interesting story for, a, for the organization getting started. So mm -hmm. thanks for that. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to say a few words about Focused Ultrasound and the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, because I know there are people online that are probably unfamiliar. Um, so focused ultrasound is early stage, non-invasive therapeutic technology, and has a potential to really improve the lives of millions of patients with a variety of medical disorders, but very importantly, including many cancers. And it can do this by providing either an alternative or a complement to existing therapies, including immunotherapy. So simply the technology works by focusing beams of ultrasound energy, precisely and accurately on targets deep in the body. These could be tumors, for instance. Um, and it does this without damaging surrounding tissue, much like focusing beams of light, sunlight, on a point with a magnifying glass. And so at the focal point where the beams converge, the ultrasound energy can produce a variety of biological effects in the tissue that can enable the treatment of a wide variety of medical disorders. And one of these very important biological effects is inducing the immune response. Um, so as we, as we know, as Jill knows, that cancer cells have a, have a way of you know, hiding and camouflaging themselves from the immune system. Focused ultrasound energy itself targeted on the tumors could perhaps help destroy that camouflage and expose tumor antigens that would then allow the immune system to detect the cancer and launch an attack on it. Um, and so what we've seen initially with focused ultrasound in some early studies is it does have a potential when combined with immunotherapies to perhaps enhance the effectiveness of the treatment. Um, and we think that could lead to maybe perhaps more patients uh, being responders to cancer immunotherapy. And it also has a potential to improve the delivery of immunotherapeutics, whether it's into the brain, whether it's into the tumor itself, uh, so that these can be delivered at higher concentrations precisely where they're needed. And so that's what we're really excited about focused ultrasound and combining it with cancer immunotherapy is because of these potential ways it could, it could help improve the treatments. And the foundation, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation ourselves, we're a unique medical research, education, and advocacy organization created in 2006 to improve the lives of millions of people with serious medical disorders by accelerating the development of focused ultrasound. Um, so as I mentioned previously, we have a particular emphasis on cancer immunotherapy and in collaboration with partners, including CRI, we really aim to explore and assess the full potential of focused ultrasound in combination with immunotherapies to treat a variety of cancers. So kind of moving back to um, the, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this uh, interview and discussion now is because June is Cancer Immunotherapy Month. Um, so I wonder if you could just say what the origin of that is and kind of the goals, overall goals of, of the month. 
Sure. So uh, Cancer Immunotherapy Month was started by the Cancer Research Institute eight years ago, and it's really a public awareness campaign to uh, uh, really inform um, the world about immunotherapy and its potentials. And it's really a, an effort to bring a, a, a variety of, of communities together, patients, uh, scientists, companies, uh, other not-for-profits, the media, to really just uh, enhance uh, information. So, you know, the program changes every year. You know, our signature program is uh, we have a Wear White Day, which was, you know, focused basically a social media campaign to talk about uh, a future immune to cancer was kind of the tagline this year and now tagline for CRI. And we do, we do do webinars. We have done, uh, we did an expert panel last week on, on cancer and COVID. Uh, we're also doing a Twitter chat coming up on the day of the life of the scientist. So it's really just an informational uh, campaign that we hope many people get behind and, and get the word out that immunotherapy is, a, uh, is revolutionizing the way cancer is treated. Yeah, and we've, the foundation is happy to be involved every year. Um, and definitely in the Wear White Day, and it, it really seems like it's, it's taken off even in the last few years and, and become more prominent, so that's great, and a lot of people seem to be learning about cancer immunotherapy. So um, what's most exciting to you right now in cancer immunotherapy? Well, I think, you know, uh, it, it, it's really been a sea change, I'd say, over the last 10 years or so, and I think what it excites me the most is that we're at a point uh, in immunotherapy history, I think we've never been at before because we do have uh, some very successful immunotherapies. And I should probably back up and say, you know, when we use this word immunotherapy and it really covers a lot of different types of treatment. I think many people use it synonymously to be linked to these checkpoint blockades, these antibodies that are used to take the breaks off the immune system. And that's certainly uh, what has revolutionized interest in the field because these were rem remarkable antibodies that if you just took the breaks off the immune system, you actually saw first in melanoma, the first time that any treatment actually changed overall survival for, for metastatic melanoma. And this is of course what Jim Allison, who's the head of our scientific advisory council, won the Nobel Prize for, for uh, two years ago. And it, uh, it, it, that is what has remarkable. It's gone on to treat probably uh, these checkpoint blockades. There's several of them. They've been approved for more than 20 something cancers. And you're seeing response rates from, you know, 80% to, you know, 20, 25%. But there are other types of immunotherapies. There's, there's, is a cellular therapy, which of course also has gotten a lot of interest, especially with the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, the CAR T cells, which in hematological malignancies are showing again remarkable response rates of 70 to 80 percent. But there are other things beyond the checkpoint blockades. There's, there's stuff beyond T cells. I think there's other immunomodulators, there's cancer vaccines, there's oncolytic viruses, there's bispecific antibodies. So it's a, it's, these are all different types of immunotherapies that are under development. So, uh, but with the checkpoints, uh, which has really, as I said, I think changed the mind of the medical community to believe that the immune system really could uh, be used to treat cancer, uh, has allowed us to now have a proof of principle that in the right patient with the right immunotherapy, you can get re remarkable responses in late stage cancers that are actually durable. And in some cases, you know, uh, especially since I said melanoma was where these first really came out, it's been like 12 years now and people with truly metastatic melanoma with maybe six months to live are still alive and cancer free 12 years from now. So this is almost miraculous, yeah. but I think it tells us it, it, it can work, but the problem is it doesn't work in everybody. But now we have the ability because you have responders and non-responders to really do that deep dive and try to understand why doesn't it work in every patient that has, you know, uh, head and neck cancer and, and uh, that is at the same stage. So I think I'm excited that the fact that technology has allowed us to do a lot of single cell analysis to able to get, you kind of drill down to see what is the difference so that the future and what the hope is, I think, in, 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 is the potential is if we can understand this, wouldn't it be great at the time of diagnosis that you, you do this analysis on, on a patient's cancer and you say, well, you not only need a checkpoint to take your breaks off the immune system, but you need X, Y, and Z, other combinations to come together that you know, allow those checkpoints to work because they're obviously not working in all patients. So why is that? And what else can we do 
in a combination therapeutic that will enable those checkpoints to work the way they do in the subset of patients they do. So I think that's what I'm most excited about. I think we're able to ask questions that we never could before, knowing that it's no longer a hypothesis, but there's actually proof that your immune system can, you know, control cancer. Yeah. So when you talk about the, you know, combinations, do, can that, can, are there limitations of that in terms of, you know, can too many com combinations of too many drugs lead to side effects that are, um, you know, unsustainable, and then also just speak to maybe some of the limitations of the current treatments? Sure. Um, that's always, I mean, as soon as you start adding more drugs together, the potential toxicity and adverse events goes up. So it's always a balancing act to find what is the level you can go to get an effect that also doesn't have, uh, you know, an adverse event. So that's certainly a challenge. I think uh, we've come to understand, I think, a little bit more about, you know, I, I guess I should step back. An immune response against cancer is multi-stepped. It's not just an automatic, you know, you have to act, the, the, end, the immune system has to first see the tumor. There has to be these tumor antigens or markers that the immune system can see. Those T cells need to be activated and primed. You then have to be able to, they, they, when they're there, they have to expand and proliferate. They have to then travel from the lymph nodes to the cancer site. They have to then, at the cancer site, infil, if it's a solid tumor, infiltrate that solid tumor, and then they have to deal with this immunosuppression that the cancer is actually caused to stop the immune response from happening. So at all these steps, we're learning the, the mechanisms involved and agents that either can positively or negatively affect these things. So I think this is where the challenge lies because there's so many potential things you could put together to combine. And how do you know what combination, first of all, is effective and what combination is right for that patient? So I think this is where uh, I think kind of reverse translation takes place. I think taking precious, precious patient samples in, in, in patients that are treated with immunotherapy to understand what is happening in that tumor milieu. What is the other, is it not just T cells, but there's, there's macrophages in there that can be either positive or negative. There's B cells. There's a lot of different cytokines being released. There's, uh, you know, antigens aren't released in some places. Why? Um, so I think that's the real challenge and it's, and it's, Hard, you're not going to be able to test all the combinations. So it becomes very difficult and try to use a lot of science, laboratory science, after you take those patient samples, bring them back into the laboratory, try to understand what's happening, create another hypothesis based on that, that data, and then bring that forward into, into the, uh, to the, back into a clinical trial into patients. So uh, that's the, I, I think that's the opportunity and the challenge. Yeah. And as you know, through all of our workshops we've had uh, around focus ultrasound and cancer immunotherapy there's you know we think there could be many ways many steps along that cycle as you talk about or maybe focused ultrasound if you plug it in in combination with say a checkpoint inhibitor could 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 be useful and it's really trying to determine you know where where is again the for different patients where would the role be um and and really trying to understand what it's doing and so we think that there are several ways that focus ultrasound could potentially play a role. Um, you know, perhaps it could take tumors that are more cold tumors that are not, um, not uh, you know, awakening the immune system initially and cause, um, again, that release of the antigens and um, potentially awakening the immune system. So that's one way we could, you know, potentially do it. Um, and then maybe it could, uh, enable a more robust and prolonged response so you know take take patients that um ordinarily would uh maybe respond for a while and then um and not and have enable them to have a more robust response um and then as i mentioned before with the delivery aspect the drug delivery aspect um you know we think that maybe if you're seeing that there's all these you know the need to go to several different drugs in combination, perhaps if focused ultrasound can have some sort of an impact, it could reduce the dose of drugs that are needed or reduce the number of drugs that are needed and potentially then reduce the side effects. So those are all different ways that I know the focused ultrasound community is thinking about how could, um, how could the technology play, play a role here. 
and we're trying to explore that obviously in partnership with with you all um, to really try to to better understand it and so i think over the last several years we have seen a growing body of research that has come about um, demonstrating that focused ultrasound can initiate a, an immune response that is effective at least in some laboratory you know laboratory models um, and particularly in combination with immunotherapies. And now we're starting to see um, clinical evidence of this. Uh, so there are a few clinical trials that are ongoing that are pairing focused ultrasound with, in this case, checkpoint inhibitors um, going on in the US. And then there's even a study that got started in France, which is trying the, now the delivery mechanism. So um, trying to, open the blood brain barrier and enable delivery of an immunotherapeutic into the, the brain to see if that can more effectively treat brain tumor. So I think there's a lot of um, exciting things going on there as well as a whole lot of preclinical laboratory studies, most of which we're, we're funding um, in partnership with, with you and some other partners, um, looking at things like melanoma, pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, um, as some, some big areas that maybe um, we could see focused ultrasound playing a role. And as you mentioned, the um, trying to get you know, as much evidence as possible from tumor samples, we've, we're making sure that all of, um, all of the focused ultrasound studies that are going on um, that can in fact take these tissue samples um, and before and after treatment, that, that they're doing so. And we've um, developed some, some guidelines uh, with the community to make sure that you know, everyone's kind of following some similar protocols in terms of getting, getting data that can be compared across these multiple studies so we can learn more about focused ultrasound as we're moving forward. And I think one of the advantages uh, of a combination with focus ultrasound, as you stated, it, it's so it doesn't really have any side effects. It's pretty safe. It's yeah. to be safe. So that's a big plus in terms of combining things because if it if that it doesn't add up to the, the additional adverse events. So I do think that you know when I think about it, you know when you when you think of tumors, you know that they they've been kind of classified into three groups. You know the immune desert, where when you take a biopsy of your tumor, there's no immune cells in the tumor at all. So that would suggest that the immune system is not seeing it at all, perhaps because it's for whatever reason, not releasing and presenting antigen. So here again, focused ultrasound could be almost a, you know, in situ vaccine. You know, you, you, yeah. could, you get there, if you kill some of those tumor cells with, with, with the focused ultrasound, releases antigens that may awaken the immune system to see it and, and start getting there. Then you have this other section of, 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 of biopsy and it would really be like immune excluded. You see the tumor, you see immune cells, but they're all staying at the barrier at the edge of the tumor and not getting in there. Again, this is another place where I think focus ultrasound because it's disruptive in tumors such as like a pancreatic tumor, which is a heavy stroma tumor. When you take a biopsy, there's obviously pancreatic cancer cells in there, but an awful lot of non cancerous cells, the stroma. And I think again, here, this is almost like a mechanical disruption of that stroma would then enable those immune systems that are obviously there and wanting to get into the tumor, not getting into the bed so that there's a place there. And obviously then there's the inflamed tumor that even at a biopsy, it looks like the tumor cells are there and they're all surrounded by, by, by immune cells, but the immune cells aren't killing. And that's because of the immune suppression. And this is where the checkpoints have come in to kind of take the brakes off of that. So this is, you know, you can see that there's there's a place if we, you know, understand how to do it and what happens that these combinations could prove very, uh, you know, fruitful in, in, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, definitely an exciting time, I think. Um, so I just wanted to kind of shift gears a, a little bit. Um, and this is part of how we advertise this conversation was, you know, obviously, all of us are living in this new reality now. And I think particularly, uh, you know, our healthcare system is in a new reality, scientific research in general, um, and then obviously patients, you know, the lives of patients. And I think specifically of cancer patients and how, you know, people are, are hesitant to, to get their screenings or hesitant to get their treatments. And, and maybe some of them were unable to get treatments for a while. So just sort of thinking about this whole environment now 
Um, I wonder if you could speak to um, some impacts that you've seen um, of COVID-19 on the field of cancer immunotherapy on the different communities that you engage with. So certainly I think uh, we've seen like, as you have seen that laboratories have been shut down. Um, basically scientific research and medical research was not taking place unless it was COVID related. Uh, so there's certainly been a pause and uh, that's not to say everything stops because I think in this day and age um, with a lot of data being generated, especially genomic data and proteomic data, there's a lot that can be analyzed, you know, not in the lab, not at a wet lab. So I think these analyses were taking place over this time. Scientists were, you know, writing manuscripts, but, you know, research stopped. And, uh, and, and, and I think that when we surveyed our funded scientists, only about 15% of them uh, pivoted their research to COVID. Uh, and obviously that was allowed to continue. We also, I think from an immunotherapy standpoint, we're in a different place because obviously we're funding a lot of basic immunology and that applies to uh, the immune response against viruses, not only cancer. So a lot of what uh, we were funding could be applied to trying to understand what do you do with COVID and what is the immune response to COVID. Additionally, uh, because the cancer immunotherapy has really moved along in terms of immune monitoring, I mean, and very detailed immune monitoring uh, at, you know, the single cell level. And, you know, certainly in New York City, where we are, and Mount Sinai being one of the hardest hit hospital systems in, in the country in terms of the volume of COVID patients, they, the immunotherapy group there, really turned on a dime and just really just for support their clinicians there to use some of the monitor the immune the assays that are developed to, to understand what's happening when you give an immunotherapy to be able to understand what is happening to the immune system in, in these COVID cancer patients. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out, you know, we know that there's a very big heterogeneity in how COVID impacts people. You know, you have some asymptomatic, you know, they're affected asymptomatic, others that get, you know, a flu but can stay home and then other people having major respiratory problems going on respirators and you know and leading to death in many cases so how do you you know to be able to triage patients and know what you can treat them that's one thing and additionally i think we do know that uh one of the side one of the the effect, major effects of, of of the COVID infection is uh, a, a cytokine storm that that kind of occurs to cause this inflammation of the lungs and that leads to the ability of the patients not being able to breathe and from immunotherapy from the car t cell uh, where this is a cellular therapy we they have seen cytokine storms as one of the side effects one of the negative side effects of, of giving this type of cellular therapy and there was at least some information knowing how to uh, limit that by, by basically using anti-IL-6. It seems to be mostly an IL-6, a cytokine that was driving this response. I think that has had mixed response with the COVID patients. I think there's papers that say it worked, papers that it says it doesn't, doesn't. I think there's some also about TNF, people having anti-TNF. So I think there's a lot still to learn about what the immune response truly is to COVID and how, how do you, it's, it seems to be overreactive in some places, but then in other places, it seems to not mount in a response at all. So you again have this two different responses, but I think the knowledge that comes out of the scientists we have funded, which there are many basic immunologists as well as tumor immunologists is really informing and helping to uh, understand how we can control and treat this. And of course, then there's vaccines. I mean, uh, you know, that what, what immunologists always focus on developing vaccines. And obviously that's a major effort right now in the hopes that we can get several vaccines that could be protect, potentially protective if, um, in, that, in case another wave comes around. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it really is, is interesting because obviously in, um, in our field, um, there's, there's not that, that tie to, to COVID. And so people just pretty much had to shut down and, you know, clinical trials and all sorts of research shutting down, but um, it, it's interesting that a lot of your researchers have been able to at least, I mean, some of them have pivoted, but then kind of been able to at least keep some things going with the- I, I, I would say that, the, you know, we, we actually, uh, my staff did a, 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 a clinical accelerated team actually published recently on a report trying to see what it, impact COVID had on oncology clinical trials. And certainly from, talking to patients, there, there was certainly a slowdown of patient accrual. I mean, even yeah. if the trials didn't shut down, they weren't opening new studies. You know, new phase one studies were basically on hold 
in, in most major medical centers. Ongoing studies were having trouble recruiting patients. Uh, also, some studies had to shut down because a lot of the trials that we uh, fund rely on getting biopsies and, do, and being able to do this correlative research and doing biomarker research. And that basically was not happening. So it was okay. not yeah. going in if you can't get the data you needed out of it. So I think that's, I'm hearing just recently, there's been a turnaround. I think trials are starting to open up again and patients coming back and obviously laboratories are opening again too. And uh, so I think that's a, a great sign. Do you think, or do you see any kind of long-term impacts that, um, you know, on the, on the field uh, that you'd expect? Well, I think there's going to be a lag because I think you can't just, if you close a lab down for four months, you, you don't just come back day one and be able to jump right into doing experiments. You know, cell lines have to be brought back up again. Everything has to go. So I think there'll be a lag. I mean, we've yeah. uh, offered to our scientists, uh, you know, extensions on their, their grants, you know, no cost extensions, just so because they couldn't meet the, the deadlines in terms of progress reports and such. Uh, and we've also, for our postdoctoral fellows, and the definite there was the feeling that especially those that are kind of third year fellows that are on the way to become assistant professors, that they were most severely impacted by this slowdown because they couldn't go to job interviews, they couldn't finish up papers they needed to kind of get to that next step. So we've actually offered uh, actually six month funded extensions to those to those people in that stage to try to help their career along because I think that's what we're hearing are the group that from a career standpoint would be uh, most impacted. So in general, then, um, I mean, you mentioned some of the ways that, that you all at CRI have responded to the pandemic. So how have you as an organization sort of been navigating the pandemic? Yeah, so we've all been home, as I think most people have, since like March 13th. Uh, so, and, and uh, I have been uh, pleasantly surprised how productive the staff has been. Uh, I think we, were, we, we kind of didn't miss a beat. I think, thank God for technologies that really allow us to continue doing what we're doing. I mean, I think everyone in the world has learned to be on Zoom meetings and, you know, and Microsoft team meetings. And so you're meeting all the time and I think people are working longer hours. And uh, so uh, that's worked. Uh, you know, I was very worried about fundraising. Uh, obviously we're an organization that raises our operating budget each year from phil philanthropic people. And, you know, we were mounting our spring campaign, uh, which was due to go out like April, right in kind of the epicenter of what was happening. And would we do it? Would we not do it? I think we were lucky because we have a story to tell that so much of the research we have done and continue to do could impact COVID. So we could add mm -hmm. that that impact in there. But I do think we have to be true to our mission. Uh, as much as COVID is happening, and there was a, obviously a, a, a focus on that, cancer is still happening. Yeah. And you know, we're not going to back away from our mission. We're not changing our mission. We still are funding cancer immunology research and cancer immunotherapy research. And I'm pleased that our, I was worried, but our spring campaign has done very well. So uh, that, that's all great signs. I'm a little bit worried about next year. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I think there's a yeah. lot of uncertainty because we just don't know uh, with the economy opening slowly, with now places that have opened, seeing resurgences in the number of cases. Uh, and so I think we're, we're cautiously optimistic, but at this point, uh, we've made no decision to go back to the office. So, uh, and I don't know when that decision will be made, kind of, uh, as I said, we're in New York City, people are still scared to get on the subways and public transportation. So yeah. until I think everyone feels safe and, uh, and, and we seem to be working quite well without going into the office. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still pretty kind of, who knows what's going to happen by next year. But um, so, you know, you mentioned that it's great that you all are staying true to your mission. I wonder about um, companies that are, you know, big into cancer immunotherapy, but maybe they've, you know, a lot of companies are also pivoting. Um, do you expect there to be a change in the pipeline of new immunotherapeutics and treatments? I don't think so. I, uh, I, I think that the, the companies that have a focus in developing immunotherapies, I think will continue to do that. I think there may be less funding from companies for more um, public awareness type things or educational things, because yeah. they might pivot those dollars more towards the immediate need of delivering healthcare to people impacted by COVID. So I'm a little, I don't know, but I, I feel that you know, companies just like us as not-for-profits believe that, you know, that cancer is still a major health issue. It impacts almost everybody. 
and uh, we need solutions. And so I don't think I, I don't think they'll 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 back off, and I I I expect it will continue. So I I mean I know for for me one of the bright spots of the pandemic has been sort of this collaborative spirit of um, communities, uh, but also including companies and including researchers and. Um, you know, I, I think we've sort of seen a trend of that move moving towards that in recent years, but I wonder your thoughts on on that and kind of that sticking around, particularly with the companies and, and if you think that will be something driving the cancer field. I, I think you're right that over the last decade or so, there's been a major change in how companies view it. I think, you know, 20 years ago, companies were very siloed and did it all themselves. And I think, especially at least for the, I can speak for the immunotherapy space, we have seen uh, with the successes that have happened with, uh, with checkpoint blockade, certainly more company turned towards immunotherapy, which they weren't focused on it before. And I think they realized that it is a big question and not one investigator, not one company can do it all themselves. And so I think, and especially when it comes to realizing that the future is probably in combinations. So many times it's, it's, you know, a new startup biotech has a new drug against a, a novel mechanism that has just been discovered. There is a lot of that collaboration with big pharma. And I think we've seen at CRI in our clinical strategy as being a kind of a not-for-profit platform that can bring not-for-profits together, but can bring companies together too. Uh, and when we've gotten a lot of support in the collaborative mind, they really feel that they're getting a, uh, great expertise from our you know scientific advisory council and the, and the scientific community that cri has built and they see it as a as doing being a shot on goal for something that may not be right in their development path but by collaborating with us and us bringing in other companies together and bringing in multiple academic sites together that they see great benefit and it's obviously great benefit for the academic investigators they are able to do trials and get access to uh, to drugs more easily through us. So I think, uh, and we, uh, even for CRI's perspective, our entire clinical accelerator program is a very centrally directed program. We just don't give grants out for someone doing a clinical trial. We're very involved with bringing a group of experts together that works on a drug selection committee and prioritizes what are the questions that should be asked that aren't already being addressed other, elsewhere. And we have decided that you know we didn't build up at CRI a clinical trials management team. You know we have partnered with the Ludwig Cancer Research or the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy or the Canadian Clinical Trials Group to be able to be the people that actually run the trials. So they're still all not for profit. They're not CROs. So it's a not for profit collaboration. But again, that is how we leverage what we do. Our dollars get leveraged, and I think so. I think that spirit of collaboration will continue because I think it's the only way we'll actually solve this problem. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like you all have been doing this for a long time. And I imagine that the, you know, current environment and particularly when we're thinking about leveraging philanthropic dollars, I imagine that that's going to be probably even a little bit more important. I know from our perspective, we'd probably say that. Um, but, um, I, I think we've we've gotten some questions in, so I am gonna try to answer some questions, but maybe if you just um, have any other thoughts on just the, you know, obviously I said we're for us, uh, our partnership with you all is is critical as we're moving forward in this space because we don't bring the immunology expertise. Um, and obviously haven't been even engaged in this area for nearly the, the time as you all. And so I think it's been, it's been really wonderful for, for us as we've kind of grown in, in this to have you all there um, kind of helping us along. So I wonder if you just had any yeah, shock. I think, I think that's right, even, even outside of clinical research, I mean, just in training and such, uh, we've seen that as immunotherapy has caught on and people believe it works, there are many times like, you know, orphan diseases or, or rare cancers that want to know is immunotherapy have, you know, have a role for them and they don't have the expertise in immunotherapy. So, you know, it's, it's great to use our scientific advisory council to review applications. And I think in, when it comes to our two organizations, you know, 
our, very rarely do the immunotherapists understand focused ultrasound. You know, perhaps if they were kind of working in a, in a radiation department or something, but it's, 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 it's something that isn't in most cases familiar to them. And I think we see that the expertise that comes with, and, and I sit in these meetings, I know focus ultrasound, there's a lot of different types of focus ultrasound, just like there's a lot of different types of immunotherapy and they all work mechanistically in a different way. And being, we need that, if you're gonna combine this, you need that, that expertise, but then those people that know focus ultrasound really don't know how to measure immuno, immune responses in patients at the detailed level that is now required with single cells. So I think bringing those two expertise together is how we can advance things. And we're seeing more and more organizations wanting to collaborate that way and, and you know, not recreate the wheel. I mean, let's, we both have different expertise. Why you don't have to build that up internally. You can actually yeah. do better by partnering. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start with a couple of the questions that we're receiving. So we did, we have received some questions about um, some of the side effects of cancer immunotherapy. And I know you alluded to that with the, with um, some of the impacts that are also similar to um, COVID um, and then how can focus ultrasound potentially reduce those effects, which I'm happy to sort of talk a little bit about, but are there, um, are there besides what you were talking yeah. about, anything else you want to add about side well, the, effects? The typical side, I mean, obviously, as we all know, any treatment has side effects. There's nothing that's really a benign treatment. I think immunotherapies have different side effects than what is typically thought about as, as chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, in most cases, the adverse events associated with immunotherapy is all due to an overactive immune system. So a lot of what happens is as you rev up your immune system so that it's going after the cancer and effective against the cancer, you have like bystander effects and, it's, and that sometimes normal cells start getting killed you know, accidentally as bystanders. So you get this inflammatory response, which is usually typical of, you know, uh, diarrhea, uh, flu-like symptoms, you know, those are the typical. And if, and again, there's heterogeneity. I mean, you, we talk to many patients that have gone through checkpoint blockade. Some of them say it's like a walk in the park. I mean, that it's like nothing, you know, you get, and then others say they do, they do have you know, significant and serious side effects related to this inflammatory response. Uh, but it does seem that immunotherapy, most of those uh, negative inflammatory responses, which initially were very serious because I think physicians didn't know how to handle that. This wasn't the typical response oncologists were seeing when they were treating with chemotherapy. They've come to learn that steroids a lot of times can quiet those effects and surprisingly still allow the immune system to kill the cancer. So that's still one of those unknown questions that seems doesn't seem like it should be true, but it is. And so that, um, that is what's happening here. Now, you could, I don't know how focus ultrasound could help with some of this, so I'll let you take that question. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think some of this, we, we would still be trying to, trying to kind of piece out. But I mean, obviously, I think if, um, if focused ultrasound itself can enhance, um, enhance the response in any way such that you need, you know, a lower dose of drug, for instance, that could potentially be, or as we talked about these combination approaches with multiple drugs, if focused ultrasound could enable the use of, you know, one versus two or two versus three, perhaps that's something. Um, then it's also just important to note that focused ultrasound kind of in the full treat, you know, has a has many roles to play sort of in the full treatment of cancer. And so it's also being used as um, an alternative to surgery in many cases, or it could be a, an adjunct um, complementary treatment to chemotherapy or to radiation, where again, it could re uh, enable you to use less chemotherapy or less radiation and still have an effect. So as I talked about the, some of the delivery aspects of focused ultrasound, so it can be used to uh, temporarily open the blood brain barrier. Um, and so creating kind of little pores in that barrier to enable drugs that ordinarily wouldn't get out of the bloodstream into the brain to get in more effectively. And so there has been some challenge with getting the right amount of immunotherapeutics into the brain for treating things like glioblastoma. And so that may be useful, uh, a tool for focused ultrasound. And then um, also its ability to sort of enable more precise delivery of drugs. So, um, you know, rather than having something, and this is mostly for chemotherapy, but I mean, there could be advantages here maybe with immunotherapy 
therapy rather than having something just flow throughout throughout the um, the the body. You can kind of bind it up in some carrier vehicle, like a microbubble, for instance, and then the ultrasound can um, disrupt that microbubble and release the drug only at the site of the tumor, for instance. So there's there's a lot of ways that can't that ultrasound is being used in the treatment of cancer. And so when we kind of think about this. Um, holistically as a cancer therapy, I think there's a lot of different ways it could play a role to hopefully reduce some side effects. Um, okay, so we have a um, question about the design or could the speaker address trial design and maybe, maybe We'll, we'll see if we can answer this together in the context of ultrasound plus immunotherapy. So there's um, a lot of different therapeutic um, components of ultrasound, um, as we mentioned, the different kind of mechanisms of action of ultrasound and um, how easy those could be shown in a feasibility study. So I think I'll just say that um, there's a lot of complexity to the design of these clinical trials. So the clinical trials that exist so far are using the thermal aspect of focused ultrasound, um, the thermal ablation, and using that to uh, to treat the tumor. And then, you know, either that they may be what they may be investigating is sort of the timing of the ultrasound with respect to the immunotherapy. So is it more important to apply the ultrasound before having the immunotherapeutics on board, or vice versa? Um, and, and trying to kind of get some of that uh, understanding. But there, but there is a lot of complexity in these trials. And so I think that we're trying to learn as much as we can from these early trials, also learn as much as we can from, um, from preclinical laboratory studies where we can then control all of these different components and, and try to better inform our, our clinical trials. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay. What role, oh, I mentioned the role of uh, BBB opening and potentially um, sending, sending things in. Um, uh, but a question is, and do you know, Jill, are immunotherapies like, um, like checkpoint inhibitors, are they failing to enter the brain um, due to BBB or do you, do you know about that? I mean, I, I don't know great specifics, but I have heard that, you know, that there have been trials and it seems like these checkpoints, because they're antibodies, they're not big things, are able to, uh, to get into the brain and treat. And there's certainly been trials that have been, you know, GBMs are tough brain cancer. And uh, there have been some trials that we've done that uh, have seen some patients respond with it. So I think that it is capable of getting there. Uh, other thing, you know, again, the immune system seems to be able to get into that blood brain barrier different than a chemotherapy drug. Uh, so. And then another part to that question, which I'll try to handle is, is the goal, would the goal be just to open the, for the use of ultrasound, just to open the blood brain barrier or also to destroy tumor cells um, or both. And I think it, it, it depends on the type of um, of the type of tumor that that would be uh, the what we'd be trying to treat and we have done some work and um, funded some work really exploring beyond just that opening of the BBB what can focused ultrasound do in a brain tumor in a glioblastoma for instance to induce an immune response so it could be that the focused ultrasound can one, help get more immunotherapeutic into the brain, into the tumor, but then it may also have another effect of uh, amping up that immune, immune response or, you know, uh, helping with the immunosuppression, like there could be different components of it. And so those are all things that we're better trying to understand. Um, and then another question about the mode, we talked about different modes of focused ultrasound that synergizes best with immunotherapies. I think we're still trying to understand that. Um, we have seen uh, another question here about um, histotripsy. So 
Histotripsy is the mechanical use of focused ultrasound uh, to, to disrupt and, and kill cells. And, and we have seen some potentially promising uh, indication that, that histotripsy could be, could be useful in inducing an immune response. In fact, there are, there's a trial going on in um, patients with liver tumors um, in Spain and at the University of Wisconsin. And this trial is not combining with an immunotherapy, but they have actually seen um, in some patients this abscopal effect where they um, are treating the primary tumor and yet they're seeing effects on other tumors, other metastases throughout the body where the, the size of the tumor is shrinking, for instance. And so they're gonna get some interesting um, immunological data from that as well. And so those kind of studies I think can, can really help us as we then design clinical trials that are pairing focus ultrasound with an immunotherapy to better, you know, better inform, inform those trials. Um, and another question here, for you, Jill, Jill is um, how do advances in personalized medicine change treatment decisions with respect to cancer immunotherapies? Yeah, so I think uh, that's where the field is moving. Uh, uh, we know, I think we've come to realize that one size treatment does not fit all. So I think uh, the more that we understand uh, the genetic makeup of the host, which is the, the patient themselves, or the, the immunological milieu of the tumor at the time of treatment, we'll, we'll make a decision on how we do personalized things. So I think, as I stated earlier on, I think that is the future, uh, is, is personalized immunotherapy. And, that, and immunotherapy means not a component of immunotherapy. It may be immunotherapy combined with a chemotherapy. It could be combined with radiation, combined with focused ultrasound. But I think it, we need to understand what works in what patients. And we're not there yet. This is not around the corner, uh, but you know, more and more personalized. And again, I guess when I could talk about the cell therapies are a little bit more personalized. Some of these are autologous. You know, the patient's own T cells get removed from the body. They get genetically engineered in a laboratory, grown and give back. So that's a very personalized. So because it's your own cells treating just you know, getting them to recognize the tumor and amping the volume of the number of them up there so that it's able to go in and overwhelm. So that's, uh, that's certainly probably the most personalized treatment that's taking place right now. And that, that, that is, there's approved CAR T cell therapies, obviously for hematological malignancies. And I think one of the challenges in the field is, can we get these remarkable responses in solid tumors? And the challenge there is that where, where these cellular therapies have been so effective has mostly been in B-cell leukemias and lymphomas. And B-cells have a marker on them called CD19, which is only found on B-cells. So it's found on normal B-cells, and if your B-cells become cancerous, it's still there. So all of these T-cells have been grown up to target CD19. So they go into your body and seek out and destroy any cell that has CD19, but only B-cells have CD19. When it comes to solid tumors, we don't have any singular marker or antigen that's so specific. And because these treatments are so powerful, if you give them and you don't realize that the marker you think you had on your prostate cancer actually is displayed in some brain cell, you're gonna destroy those brain cells as well as, the, uh, as well as the prostate cancer cells. So I think that's the challenge of figuring out how do you target these powerful uh, cellular therapies uh, two solid tumors. And there's a lot of research going on there, which would again be personalized. Um, I'm wondering if there's any delivery aspect of that where focus ultrasound could potentially play a role um, in terms of enhancing. Yeah, I mean, I guess I mean, possibly, I think the cellular therapy, I mean, one of the aspects of the immune system is it is, it is a systemic treatment in most cases, uh, you know, so that it, it does, that's one of the the hallmarks of it is that it can seek out and destroy these micrometastases that you may not even know are there because you have T cells circulating throughout your blood system and the lymphatic system. But uh, you know, maybe depositing something, you know, that that is triggered more specifically. It, it, it's a possibility, I think. Yeah. yeah. And what is this um, in terms of CAR T cells? Are they now FDA approved for? Yes. They're FDA approved for a few le leukemias and lymphomas, but as okay. I said, these are only these B-cell lymphomas, but yeah. extremely active area of research. When you do a survey and see what types of immunotherapies are in, a you know, in development, you know, I think the last time we said there's almost 4,000 different immunotherapies in development wow. right now. 
and yeah. cellular therapy, if you break it down between like vaccines or checkpoints or you know, other immunomodules, cellular therapy is the type of immunotherapy that has seen the most dramatic increase in the number of trials and the number of developments. So it's certainly a hot area because I think it's, uh, it, it's showing how effective it could be. We just have to figure, can we get it to, uh, to solid tumors? Yeah, yeah. Well, great. And we managed to answer all of the, um, all of the questions and everything, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, so thank you again, Jill, for this discussion. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope that everyone in, enjoyed it as much as, as I did. Um, so, thank you for your partnership. Thanks for supporting sure. the Therapy Month. And uh, uh, it's great to see you. Absolutely. Um, so to everyone, this concludes today's webinar. Um, if you think of any questions that you didn't, you know, think of during this time, feel free to visit our website um, at fusfoundation.org for more information, or you can email us at info at fusfoundation.org. And I thank you all for joining us and stay tuned to our newsletter and our website for invitations to future webinars. Have a great day, everyone.